Impaired boating is impaired driving. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jason Piercy, and this is a very special Out of the Fog presentation that we like to call Out of the Vault. Sometimes we like to dig deep into some of the conversations that we have had previously so that we can share them with you again. And tonight, this is a very timely one. As you are watching this episode, you have likely heard that local political legend, the Honorable Mr. John Crosby, has recently passed away. Mr. Crosby has had a huge impact on our province in a whole bunch of ways, from university chancellor to lieutenant governor. The only thing he was more well known for than his political career was probably his wit, scathing at times and always entertaining. Mr. John Crosby is a legend in our province, so let's dig deep into our vault and remember him. He was controversial in politics and even as a retired politician. His appointment as Lieutenant Governor raised a few eyebrows. Three years into his appointment, we sit down with the honorable and unforgettable John Crosby. And welcome to Out of the Fog, everyone. Well, it's rare that a politician can humor, infuriate, and gain the respect of so many people in their career. But John Crosby was that rare type of politician. Crosby could hold an audience captive with a speech. You know, those listening, waiting for the next line of wit that would crack a smile on some, would grate the nerves of others. You know, he understood the power of speech and always seemed to welcome a challenge in the House of Commons from a politician on a tirade over one of his Crosby-isms, as it became known. And he did have a few worthy opponents over the years. But his wit was only a tool used to shape his career in what seemed to be his true passion, politics. His career was long and successful. So let's take a look back now through much of the history the Honorable John Crosby has been a part of. Honest and forthright, quick-witted and sharp, the Honorable John Crosby leaves an impressive mark on the face of politics in Newfoundland and Labrador and in Canada. Coming from a family of prominent politicians after completing law school, it was natural for Crosby to join Joey Smallwood's cabinet and begin his career in politics. He worked in numerous ministerial positions during his political career. Proving essential in the creation of the Newfoundland and Labrador Housing Corporation and in the passing of the legislation that created the Newfoundland Medicare Corporation and later the Newfoundland Medicare Plan. Crosby moved into federal politics and quite notably participated in the development of the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement and the following NAFTA agreement. While the Cod Moratorium was a devastating time for the province, he was instrumental in obtaining significant resources to assist affected fishermen and plant workers through the difficult time. I didn't take the fish from the goddamn water. Crosby was a colorful politician, always frank and frequently brusque, Certainly his opinions have always been clear and his contributions many. And from 1994 to 2008, he served as a Memorial University Chancellor, during which time he published his autobiography, No Holds Barred. And on February 8, 2008, he was appointed as Lieutenant Governor of Newfoundland and Labrador. And he currently resides in Government House with his wife, Her Honor, Jane Fresno Crosby. And when we come back, we're going to go down to Government House and sit down with the Honorable John Crosby himself. The lift wasn't working, and he was in pain, so I tried to lift him on my own. Yes, it's bad. I'll need help. Oh. Can I help you with that? No, I'm good. Thanks. Workplace injuries hurt the most at home. You're watching Rogers TV, St. John's. It's been three years since the Honorable John Crosby was appointed 12th Lieutenant Governor of Newfoundland and Labrador. Now, the decision came as a shock to some, which was only fitting for somebody like Crosby, who was often a cohort of contention. 
And as we're about to hear, the appointment surprised even Crosby himself. His honor invited out of the fog down to Government House for a straightforward chat about his appointment, his political career, and his opinion on another politician known to enjoy a good scrap, Danny Williams. Here's that interview. Well, welcome to Out of the Fog, Your Honor. Oh, nice to be here. Thanks for taking the time. This February past marked your third year in the appointment of Lieutenant Governor. How have you been enjoying the appointment so far? Well, uh, I'm surprised that uh, we are enjoying this. You know, I, I was uh, not, not uh, eager to become Lieutenant Governor, and it had never been an ambition of mine. Uh, to become Lieutenant Governor, and I was quite surprised when the Prime Minister called and, and, and uh, said he would like to appoint me to the post of Lieutenant Governor. But uh, I must say that we, Jane, my wife and I, have really enjoyed this. It's been a wonderful opportunity to uh, get around this province and see the province and uh, uh, and the, the public is supportive of the lieutenant governor, the concept, you know. At the time of your appointment, you know, three years ago, mm -hmm. perhaps in true John Crosby style, there was some controversy over you being given the appointment simply because you were known as such a, you know, opinionated and outspoken politician. Mm -hmm. uh, you just mentioned something about it, but were you, were you really that surprised to, to hear that you were being considered and then ultimately given, given the appointment? Yeah, I, I was surprised because it, uh, I had not heard it mooted before or suggested, and I I hadn't, uh, let's say, been looking, you know, for an appointment or anything of that nature. So I, I was surprised, and uh, I suggested to the prime minister, you know, look, uh, there's some the thinking down here that it's time we had a woman. A lieutenant Governor. We have never had a woman Lieutenant Governor, so I brought that to his attention, and I thought that Jane would probably be a better candidate than I was, and that uh, she was considered for the position. I certainly do all I can could to, uh, you know, fit the role of her uh, cohort or companion. But in any event, the Prime Minister. Uh, I, I didn't accept the appointment first. I said I didn't think so. But my family convinced me that I should. My sons, I think, thought uh, this time, uh, you know, if they're not careful, they're going to have to be looking after me. Or <laughs> 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 so uh, they, con they convinced me, though, this is something I should look at and consider positively. So I, I went back to the PMO and told them, and uh, the appointment was carried out. The only reason I suppose it was probably controversial at the time was because so much of your political career can be put into quotes. <laughs> and there were some right. extremely well-known ones, uh, you know, such as Pasta Tequila Sheila in reference to Sheila Cops. Right. And also when you were going for uh, the federal Tory leadership and someone, of course, brought up the fact that you couldn't speak French and you said, of course, I don't speak Mandarin Chinese either. Right. These are just a couple of them. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you know, they certainly were entertaining and they got you noticed by all means. Was there any time where you came away and thought, I, I can't believe that slipped out of my mouth. <laughs> I didn't mean for that to happen. My career spanned 27 years and uh, first in Newfoundland for, for 10 years in the elected politics here and the House of Assembly and, the, and also a, a disagreement with Mr. Smallwood, etc. So there are a lot of hectic events uh, that went on. But, uh, you know, occasionally uh, I've regretted making some statement. You know, it's impossible for you not to, uh, uh, no one is perfect, so you're going to do things occasionally that, that if you thought uh, more intensely about it, you might have avoided it. But uh, I haven't, uh, uh, nothing has happened during my lieutenant governorship. You know, so far I've been very lucky. I haven't gotten any problems about partisanship uh, and uh, so I, I tried to be careful and I can't make statements that uh, public statements that appear to discriminate or not approve of any political party so you had to be quite careful uh, so what you're saying which rather spoils things because how can you make a speech that's of any interest to an audience or speak publicly if you uh, can't uh, be critical of anyone or you can't uh, 
attack or, you know, you can't uh, engage in vigorous debate. So that's a bit of a handicap, but so far it's gone well. And uh, I do get a chance to speak quite frequently here. And, and, and as long as I observe the guidelines, uh, I'll continue to do that. And, but I had to be very careful, I had not to be very careful, careful not to show any, not to show any obvious bias against, obvious bias against any, any particular or views parties. or parties. And I can imagine that must be a struggle for someone like yourself. Yeah. But, you know, in, in your political career, uh, you know, given so, so many of these things that were put in the quotes, I mean, it, people remember them now across the country. You know, the strange thing about that is, is of course, it does get you noticed. You know, and as far as your popularity can increase or decrease with it, depending on how much opposition there is to what you've said. Mm -hmm. But you do have to spend a fair bit of time commenting on what you've said, defending it one way or another. Is it an effective way to be a politician, simply because it takes so much of your time having to, having to sort of defend yourself? Well, it never took all that much of my time, and I always involved. Uh, I always enjoyed uh, being in debate or controversy. And uh, so I never hesitated to say, uh, as long as it was something that I believed in, to, uh, uh, to be outspoken. And it's never been a great problem. The biggest example, of course, was the one with the Sheila Copps, because for some reason the, uh, uh, the feminist uh, movement uh, took offense at what uh, I had uh, said in, in, in uh, with, with uh, Sheila. Now, Sheila is quite uh, able to look after herself. She doesn't need anyone uh, defending her. And I must say, I did enjoy my disputes with her, but we're good friends now, you know, since uh, I've been out of active politics, and uh, I have nothing bad to say about her. I like a, a woman who's feisty, or not a woman, or a man, you know, or who has views and expresses them. So I never found it any, uh, you, there's a, you, if you're going to be making a lot of speeches, you've got to try to entertain an audience, you know, you have to try to entertain the audience that you're speaking to. If you want them to listen to you and to uh, think about anything that you're saying, you have to keep them interested. And if you want to keep an audience interested, you've got to be lively and you've got to say things that are controversial or use quotations or say things that are amusing. You've got to keep the audience interested. When you talk about, you know, a, a speaker being controversial and getting, getting things stirred up, um, mm -hmm. you know, certainly a past politician who did just that, of course, was Danny Williams. Mm -hmm. um, and if popularity is a measure of a good politician, then he must have been a great one because he had, you know, he, he had widespread popularity not only throughout the province but right. the country. What did you think about his style of politics? Well, I thought that Danny uh, was very, very effective. I didn't uh, appreciate how much depth he had until he resigned, because that was a master stroke. The problem with most politicians uh, are people who have a, a bit of power is that they don't want to give it up. And uh, most of them always get into trouble near the, the end of their career because they try to hang on too long. And then there's a lot of dissatisfaction, and eventually they get forced out. And Danny avoided all of that. I thought uh, I, I had no idea that he was going to resign when he did. But uh, after uh, I heard his resignation and uh, uh, took it all in, I thought it was a masterstroke. He was going out at the height of his popularity and powers, and. Uh, he didn't, he, he didn't wait around another three or four years and have opposition and people trying to push him out. You know, Danny was a master politician, and to my mind, he, that was his final proof that, that he really had mastered the, uh, uh, the politics. You know, all the things which we're reflecting on your life and speaking about some other politicians here as well, what do you think it takes to be a good politician today? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think you've got to be a hard worker. You, uh, you certainly have to be the type that can take criticism and uh, not get uh, offended or deterred by the fact that you may be criticized or run into uh, or attacked, etc. if you take certain stands. You, you must be able to withstand criticism. and. Uh, so that's one essential. You've got to be tough, you've got to be determined, uh, and you, you, 
you you have to be on the ball all the time. You, you know, you can't afford to make uh, mistakes uh, that can be used against you too greatly. But uh, you, but you had also to be not afraid of being criticized. Uh, I mean, you're going to be criticized anyway, so it's just as well to make your mind up that not everyone loves you. I remember when I first started out, how surprised I was to find that everyone didn't love me. You know that uh, every uh, that uh, much to my you know chagrin, uh, everyone wasn't supportive of me. This take. Uh, this is, a, you know, you learn that is, and sometimes it's a big shock, you know, you're not as well regarded as you thought you were. The worst year of my life in politics uh, occurred, which was when I had to close, I was Minister of Fisheries and had to announce the shutdown of our fishery, uh, the salt cod fishery, which had been the whole reason of being for Newfoundland, particularly the rural areas, and uh, I wouldn't have survived that if I'd been the type to be deterred or frightened by criticism and so on. We have to take a short break, but when we come back to Out of the Fog, we'll speak to the Honorable John Crosby further about the day he announced the shutdown of the cod fishery and also about his wife, Jane. Stick around. All right, girls. Uh, Mom, you said it's played again. Workplace injuries hurt the most at home. July 2nd, 1992, will certainly be a defining day in this province's history. And you were given perhaps the unfavorable task of announcing to Newfoundland and Labrador that they were no longer going to be able to fish northern cod. What was it like to be John Crosby that day when you walked through the delta up to that microphone to make that announcement? Well, that, that was tough. And the day before was uh, tough because the day before July 1st, and uh, I had been invited to Bay Bulls, which was in my district, to speak to them on Bay Bulls Day. And of course, uh, the, it was leaking out and everybody knew there was going to be a serious and dramatic announcement about the uh, fishery quotas for, salt, for codfish, northern cod, and that uh, bad things were in prospect. And uh, so I, I went down to Bay Bulls that, uh, that day to speak to the people down there because uh, I was their MP and uh, they were expecting me there. And when I got near Bay Bulls, I saw a number of CBC uh, vehicles parked on the road and a whole lot of people down on the wharf. Now, I knew that the CBC wasn't coming out to, uh, to, to cover my speech to Bay Bulls Day about Bay Bulls and how wonderful they were. So I knew something was up, that there was going to be trouble. And uh, when I saw about a thousand people down around the wharf. Uh, that was, of course, an added. Uh, and I had my wife with me and my uh, children or, or, and their grandchildren, uh, some, uh, some of them quite young. And uh, the, the crowd was hostile, you know, as, you, uh, as I walked down to the wharf because they were very nervous, naturally. I didn't blame them because uh, <coughs> their livelihoods were in jeopardy and so on. So. Uh, that was a tough uh, day, but uh, but I knew from that experience uh, that that there was going to be a lot of trouble when this announcement uh, was made the next day, and I had known for two or three months that we were going to have to close the fishery. So when I made the announcement, I knew that the program of assistance we had wasn't going to be satisfactory to anyone. 
And, uh, were you at all scared that day? I mean, there was so much emotion going through the people who knew they mm -hmm. were going to lose their livelihood. Was it a nervous time for you when you had to... Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, you naturally you were nervous and, and aware that you were going to be... You know, that you were facing a lot of difficulty and trouble. When we made the announcement down at the hotel, these were things that always go wrong that you don't think of. But uh, when our press conference went ahead that afternoon, naturally the moored fishermen and so on had been gathering at the hotel down there and, and uh, having the odd drink and so on, waiting for the announcement. And uh, they had the press conference and without bringing it to my attention, they had the press conference in one room where I would make my statement and the press would be, uh, and, they, and they had it arranged so that uh, ex, uh, other than news people, the ordinary uh, citizen or, or fisherman or whoever uh, wouldn't be permitted in that room, they would be off in another room next door, and they could watch it and listen to it on TV, but on TV, and so they weren't permitted, so they weren't permitted where I, had making my where I was making my statement. And uh, this created a lot of tension, and uh, you will recall, if you were on at the time, that w once the, the press conference started and I started my statement, the, uh, the fishermen outside uh, uh, were, were very much put out that they weren't allowed in the room where the announcement was being made. Now, that was a bad mistake, and had I known that that was what they were doing, I would have put a stop to it, but I didn't. And so they started to charge the doors, and luckily the doors were very, <laughs> they had very good, strong doors down at the hotel that we were making the announcement in. But anyway, as I was making my statement, you'd hear these tremendous crashes, right, as mm -hmm. they assaulted the doors to try to get in. Well, that was a very bad uh, thing that, that happened that shouldn't have if uh, my advisors or the PR people had been more alert. You know, as we're sitting here, you know, we're reflecting on a lot of the things that happened in your life, of course. It, it, it just goes to show the amount of changes, you know, that you've seen in the province and that you've gone through yourself throughout your career. But one constant that's been in your life the whole time, of course, has been your wife, Jane. And you wrote very early on in your biography that she helped produce the journey for you. Can you just tell us what you meant by that? Well, we're 58 years married now. You know, I can't <laughs> believe it, that this is so. And uh, but I've been very lucky. And of course, originally, uh, uh, I know that I met Jane for the first time really in kindergarten at Bishop Spencer College, <laughs> where I went. For, you went there as a boy for the first couple of years before you moved to Bishop Field. And uh, I can re remember her in kindergarten. And at that time, I was a real bully boy. <laughs> and I used to. Uh, I used to bar the girls in the cloakroom. There's this cloakroom there, you know. And, and uh, so Jane remembers me um, being a real bully boy and frightening all the girls. <laughs> That's where I first met her, and then later on I met her when, uh, when we were 17. And so we've been married 58 years, and she's been a great support to me. And, and even in my political career, when I became very busy as a minister and had to travel in elections to other provinces and so on. She did the campaigning for me, you know, went door to door. And she's tremendous at that. And she's a very pleasant woman. And so I, I have been very lucky uh, with my, uh, with the fact that uh, she and I met and that we've been married for all these years. You've got uh, two years left as in your appointment as Lieutenant Governor. Um, what do you think you'll do then when that's up? Well, I'm not going to, um, look, I'm really lucky. Hey, that Jane and I both became 80 this year. Well, I never had, uh, I never thought for a minute that I would ever live as long as I've lived. And I'm delighted that I have and I'm enjoying it. We just had a marvelous trip to the, the Far East on, on our holiday, uh, paid for by ourselves, by the way. So we've been lucky to have a chance to see that. So, uh, in the, uh, uh, what I would likely do, uh, I don't think I'm employable probably any longer, but uh, I may well write a book, an, another book, because it's 20 years since I left active politics, 
and I've still got my own views and, and the things that I'd like to pursue and announce and the views that I would like to give. So I may be tempted to do another book. I did one before called No Holds Barred. And uh, I'll, never I'll never forget the time that uh, I was going into the, the shopping center and I came to this store which had a sign about my book in the front of it, No Holes, H-O-L-E-S, Bard. Oh my God, I, I rushed into the store and I said, look, you've know, got to do something about this, <laughs> this sign out here. You've know? you got to get the spelling corrected for that one. So, it, so that's uh, it's always risky. But no, I'm think I'm, uh, that I, I'm not going to just do nothing. I'm going to keep interested. And so I might do a book or maybe somebody who'll who will uh, use me for some work or other, and if so, I'll be interested. Uh, that's if I'm, if I've got, if I'm compass mentis, you know, you don't know. Because the trouble is that you don't know whether you're compass mentis or not. <laughs> 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 so I'm not sure that I'm going to believe I'm compass mentis, and I might try to do bo a book. Well, thanks very much, Your Honor, for taking yeah, the time to well, see Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Okay. I hope you enjoyed watching Aaron and Josh talk about the Honorable Mr. John Crosby. As you can tell by what was put together back in 2011, there's a lot to be said about such a man and such a legend he was in our political climate in a whole bunch of ways. So here at Rogers Television, our hearts and our condolences go out to the Crosby family and to the province. And to you yourself, Mr. John Crosby, thank you. And thank you guys for watching Out of the Vault. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. All right, girls. Uh, Mom, you said it's played again. Workplace injuries hurt the most at home. Send them home. Get rid of them. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. And so, this organ, which I regret I cannot name, because of the presence of these members of the weaker sex, who, although they are married, could not possibly endure. <laughs> Get them out. This is Ginny. Patience. Get them out!